The music of the Founders Song, O Boundless Salvation, the Army's unofficial anthem. Written by William Booth, it gives us a hint of the heart of the man and the essence of the movement. It's almost like hearing from the man himself, something that is not entirely beyond us. I am glad you are enjoying yourself. The Salvationist is the friend of happiness. Making heaven on earth is our business. Serve the Lord and gladness is one of our favorite mottoes. So I am pleased that you are pleased. But amidst all your joys, don't forget the sons and dogs of misery. Do you ever visit them? Come away and let us make the call. Here is a home. William Booth, recorded in the last decade of his life, confirming his commitment to the vision spelt out almost 20 years before in the Darkest England scheme. This small masterpiece of a sermon deals directly with the sort of reservations some still express about the Salvation Army's commitment to a gospel that cares as much about this world as it does the next. One has to ask, how did William Booth come to this vision? Did it spring unbidden? Was it unique to Booth? Well, no, actually. William Booth acknowledged he stood on the shoulders of giants. In this episode, we're going to look at some of the people and ideas that helped shape the Booths and led to the foundation of the Salvation Army. Booth often declared his great hero to be John Wesley. John Wesley was the founder of the Methodist Church, a branch of which William and Catherine belonged to before beginning their work with the Christian mission that in turn gave rise to the Salvation Army. Wesley is responsible for a revolution in Christian practice, a revolution known to history as the Evangelical Revival, or the Great Awakening. From the 1740s, the revival launched by Wesley and his associates burned its way across England and the United States, giving rise to both modern evangelical Christianity and what's called the Holiness Movement. John Wesley read a lot. John Wesley read ancient Christian sources from the early fathers. He read Reformation works. He read books about French Catholics of the 17th century and always his concern was the very practical one with how one increases one's spirituality. Where is holiness to be found? How is it to be attained? 
And that's the question he asked of all these sources, and he tried to put them all together. John Wesley was a most unlikely revolutionary. He was a high church Anglican with an interest in the spirituality of the early church fathers. But what he saw in the Christianity of his time distressed him. Church attendance was low. English Protestantism was dominated by a rather legalistic view of God as an absolute sovereign, or rather a heavenly chief magistrate dispensing a rather firm vision of biblical law. It was a worldview derived from the teachings of John Calvin, a French lawyer turned theologian, and one of the leaders, along with Martin Luther, of the great split in the universal church that became known as the Protestant Reformation. I make bold because it is my duty to serve you and to warn you of the crooked practices of those who claim to represent your grace. Christ did not command the preaching of indulgences, but of the gospel. Martin Luther, are you the author of these writings? I am. You question the authority of the church council, sir? My conscience is captive to the word of God. When Luther famously nailed his theses to the cathedral door at Wittenberg in Germany, he was protesting the abuse of authority by the Church of Rome. The only true source of power and authority, declared Luther, was God, and his will was revealed through his word, the Bible. Some of the followers of John Calvin took this even further. God's sovereignty was absolute. God knew the beginning and the end of everything. All was fixed. Not only was your fate in the next life predestined and predetermined, so too was your existence here and now. You can still get a hint of it from a rarely used verse of the much-loved 19th century hymn, All Things Bright and Beautiful. The rich man in his castle the poor man at his gate. God made them high and lowly and ordered their estate. That is, if you're rich, enjoy it. If you're poor, get used to it. That's the way God planned it. That's the way he meant for it to be. If you're cast on the losing side in this ballot, there's not a lot to be happy about. And if you choose to inquire as to how you know whether you're a winner or a loser, the bleak answer was, you wrestle with it. Evangelicals in the 18th century were very different from those who were Protestant Christians in the 17th century. In the 17th century, very often they doubted whether they really were Christians, even though they believed the truths of the gospel. So they wrestled with themselves. To compound your uncertainty, there was much argument over correct biblical interpretation. In reaction to the discredited authority of Rome, many now went to the other extreme and redefined the church as meaning only the gathered local congregation. It's the ideal of the church that was adopted by the early Congregationalists, who also called themselves independents because they believe that every congregation is independent of every other. Now, that congregational ideal was taken up by many other groups in subsequent centuries, especially groups of a more sectarian tendency. The century before Wesley witnessed religious wars across Europe and a great civil war fought in England, largely on sectarian grounds. This legalistic and fractious Christendom did not accord with Wesley's vision of the kingdom of God. In the great Reformation tradition of sola scriptura, sola fide, one Bible, one faith, Wesley retained a vision of the connected church universal as the visible body of Christ in the world, and a God who so loved the world that he gave his only Son, and that whosoever believes may be saved. Wesley shared the views of some former disciples of Calvin, most particularly Jacob Arminius, and his supporters including this man, Hugo Grotius. Arminius believed in the sovereignty of God. He also believed that human free will, our capacity to accept or reject God's love, was essential to understanding the fullness of divine grace. 
Yes, God is all-powerful and sovereign, argued Arminius. His power is so great, he can choose to suspend his sovereignty, to give humanity freedom of choice. With that freedom comes responsibility. Responsibility for myself, my neighbour and the world. The gospel is universal. From this understanding, Arminius's colleague, Hugo Grotius, went on to become a great lawyer and teacher and today is regarded as one of the founders of international law, the law governing relations between peoples. This meant, of course, then, that not only did they understand theology differently, they discovered that it affected the way they understood people, society, common law, and all of those kinds of things. Wherever you have real Wesleyan thinking, you have people concerned, vitally concerned, for right laws and for social justice. Wesley was so convinced of Arminius' views, he called his magazine The Arminian. These reflections led him back to the Reformation teachings of Martin Luther and most particularly to the warm-hearted German pietists who put stress not just on law and doctrine but on the practical love of God expressed through the sacrificial life of the believer. Christianity was love in action. At a meeting of German Moravian Christians in Aldersgate, London in May 1738, Wesley felt his heart strangely warmed. He says, I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine. Here began the Great Awakening. May the 24th, 1738, was the turning point in Wesley's life. He heard, as you know, someone reading from Luther's preface to the Epistle to Romans. He says, an assurance was given to me that Christ had forgiven me. And that's what triggered off the joy. And the way in which John Wesley expressed this was that they had the witness of the Spirit within them. That is to say that the Holy Spirit inside their, their lives confirmed that they really were Christians. This is the doctrine that's more broadly spoken of as Christian assurance. Then he discovered that joy was directly linked to holy living. And he further discovered that holy living was to be like Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. That joy is fully realised in following Christ's way, Christ-likeness, holiness. John Wesley meant by entire sanctification the idea that before we die, while we're still alive on earth, we can be entirely holy in a sense acceptable to God. We can enjoy what he called perfect love. That was his favourite phrase for it, in which God is pleased with us and we'll go straight to heaven therefore. And he found that several of his followers had an experience of reaching that entire sanctification and therefore taught it. He never thought he reached it himself. A very impressive sign of humility and perhaps even of holiness. For Wesley, God's love was the issue. God loves the world and he loves us. This love is available not just to a predetermined few, but whosoever will may be saved. Moreover, God does not leave us to wrestle with our condition. By grace, through faith, we are assured of salvation. We feel it. My chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth, and followed thee. The Wesleyan Arminian position says God loves people, therefore we are going to love people. We're going to act fairly. We are going to be involved in those things that concern our brothers and sisters. We are going to be concerned about social justice, holiness. Wesley's understanding of holiness is linked to Arminius's understanding of grace. These all come from God to all people and are channeled in love to all people. And anything less, as far as Wesley was concerned, was not authentic holiness. John Wesley took the Bible seriously. In the kingdom of God, there is neither Jew nor Greek, nor bond, nor free, nor male, nor female, but all are one in Christ. Women and men, black and white, 
all believers are priests. Methodist lay people, men and women, became active agents for the gospel. John Wesley himself travelled a relentless 8,000 miles a year on horseback and preached a total of some 42,000 sermons, claiming, The world is my parish. Yet it was through the songs of his brother Charles that his message spread across the globe. And it was done with style. Here's an 18th century worship band. The song and the tune are instantly recognisable, but the rhythm is a dance rhythm. Just like Martin Luther and later William Booth, Wesley's optimistic faith was not prepared to let the devil have all the good tunes. Poetry could impart doctrine. Some of Charles's over 5,000 songs contained up to 17 verses. And music could move hearts, particularly to the joy of new life in Christ. Joy in us, holy joy, is that which motivates us to reach out redemptively to a dying world. Holiness is joyful, holiness serves, holiness is to be like Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. I think that's what Wesley discovered on May the 24th, 1738. The Salvation Army is a direct expression of this Wesleyan inheritance. If we look at the way various denominations emerged from the Reformation, we can trace the reformed dissenting strand in one group and the more conservative central strand in another. What's interesting is where the Salvation Army fits. In fact, the Salvation Army belongs not with the dissenters, but to the more theologically traditional strand emerging out of Catholicism through Anglicanism and Methodism. Historically and theologically, the Salvation Army springs from the main trunk of the Universal Church. Wesley's theological understandings of freedom, responsibility and God's care for all resonated strongly with the emerging ideas about universal principles of justice and individual freedom known today as the European Enlightenment. The Christian's task was not just the redemption of the individual, but the transformation of society. When the emotional power of a joyous, life-transforming gospel was wedded to a practical demand to change the world and preached in the streets of the land, could social revolution be far behind? More than one historian has suggested that by awakening the social conscience of England, the Wesleyan influence saved the nation from the horrors of the revolution that engulfed France, where church and state ignored the plight of the poor. A few days before he died in this house in 1791, John Wesley wrote what was to be one of his final letters to William Wilberforce. He challenged Wilberforce to go in the name of God and the power of his might till even American slavery, the vilest that ever saw the sun, shall vanish away before it. Mr Wilberforce, we understand you're having problems choosing whether to do the work of God or the work of a political activist. We humbly suggest that you can do both. She do not bear. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a slave ship, the Madagascar. It has just returned from the Indies where it delivered 200 men, women and children to Jamaica. When it left Africa, there were 600 on board. The rest died of disease or despair. That smell is the smell of death. Slow, painful death. William Wilberforce, however, returned to his family, lay his head on his pillow, and remember, the slave trade is no more.
Forty years later, the night Wilberforce died, Parliament passed the Emancipation Act. This building, the Lincoln Memorial, is dedicated to the man Americans regard as perhaps their greatest president. The man who through a bloody civil war led the battle to free the slaves. The battle that was fought here by Abraham Lincoln was a fight as much for universal values as it was for individual rights. In this handwritten note, Abraham Lincoln acknowledges the debt to evangelicals like Wilberforce. One evangelical in particular was to drive the mission of both Wesley and Wilberforce across the United States in the years leading to the Great Civil War. Charles Grandison Finney. Finney was a Congregationalist profoundly influenced by Wesleyan thought. His radical revivalist preaching and methods swept across the United States, and inspired by Wesley, he took up the anti-slavery cause as an issue of universal justice. Wherever he preached, membership in the anti-slavery movement increased. Embracing Wesley's views on human responsibility, Finney believed revivals sprang not just from the mysterious movement of the spirit, but from the practical hard work of believers. He believed the preacher's job was not simply to expound the scriptures and leave it to the Lord, but to convince people to follow Christ. And to this end, all the devices of rhetoric and technology should be employed. He's the one responsible for such familiar salvationist icons as the penitent's form or mercy seat, the mourner's or anxious bench as it's sometimes called. Finney's methods became known as the New Measures. Finney's revivals were central to what's called the Second Great Awakening. In the 19th century, the one who articulated the Wesleyan movement in the United States of America more than anyone else was Charles Finney. Billy Graham says, in the 20th century, I did not match the impact that Charles Finney had in the 19th century in the United States of America. But there is the perfect example of a holistic gospel. When he preached, he called people forward to give their lives to Christ. He invited them down the aisle. As a matter of fact, historians would argue he's the one that really invented the whole idea of the invitation, where you sing just as I am and come down the aisle and kneel in the front. But when you came down the aisle and kneeled in the front to accept Christ as personal savior, he immediately marched all the new converts into the back room. And they weren't simply given a gospel of John and told to recite a little prayer. There were two tables. One was for the feminist movement, and the other was for the anti-slave movement. And if you became a Christian, you were expected to commit yourself to one or the other of these movements. And if you weren't willing to commit yourself to changing the world in the name of Christ, he would say to them, go back and take your seat, you're not serious about becoming a Christian. Becoming a Christian was more than just getting cleansed of your sin. It was turning your life over to Christ so that Christ could accomplish in the world what he wanted to accomplish. Finney conducted crusades in England and came to be much admired by this woman. The Wesleyan newspaper favorably compared her preaching style to that of Finney's. And when asked, she once described William as an English Charles Finney. Catherine sent her eldest son, Bramwell, off on holiday with a copy of Finney's sermons tucked under his arm. Finney's Lectures on Revivals was a principal textbook for the first sessions of Salvation Army officer cadets. If Finney's influence helped shape the Booth's evangelical style, it was another American who profoundly influenced Catherine and William's view of the Christian life. Phoebe Palmer is both a pioneer feminist and holiness teacher. If women could be filled with the spirit as men, then surely they could preach and teach as men did. Like Wesley and Finney, Palmer was committed to the spirit-filled life, a second blessing that empowered the Christian to be Christ in the world. Beginning with a Tuesday ladies' meeting in her sister's home, Palmer's altar theology eventually spread worldwide. 
Her base was a mission she helped establish and maintain in one of the vilest quarters of New York City, the infamous Five Points District. The Five Points Mission and its anti-slavery campaign was the focus of much of the action of gangs of New York. But if the anti-slavery movement gained much of its moral force from the Wesleyan optimism of evangelical Christians in the North, reflected in their anthem, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord, another vision entirely was unfolding for Christians in the South. In the wake of the Civil War, they were left only with an apocalyptic vision of a world gone with the wind. There's no law. The whole political system has collapsed. It's anarchy. People are killing, looting, stealing. For many people in the spring and summer of 1865, there was the sense that the world had come to an end, that they were living almost as, uh, as one said, at the end times. They have slaughtered our kindred, destroyed our prosperity, and filled our whole land with sorrow, one young planter wrote. If I should have children, the first ingredient of their education shall be hatred and contempt of the Yankee. In such an atmosphere, it's hardly surprising that a new form of Christian interpretation fell on sympathetic ears. A doctrine arose that the church had no business with the things of this world, a fallen world that would one day, one day soon, be swept away. Some gravitated to the teachings of a small English sect, the Plymouth Brethren, and the writings of their founder, John Nelson Darby. His teachings, known as premillennial dispensationalism, eventually spread widely through such publications as the Schofield Reference Bible. They were pessimistically focused not on the redemption of the world, but on its coming destruction. You gotta watch out in this salvationist movement because you're about to get seduced by a bunch of dispensationalists. You say, what are they? Well, you know, most of you believe in the rapture, don't you? That is not part of William Booth's theology. It wasn't in Calvin, it wasn't in Luther, it wasn't in Zwingli, it wasn't in Augustine, it wasn't in Aquinas, it wasn't in the Church Fathers. It was invented in 1830 by a preacher in Plymouth, England, named John Darby. He came up with that concept of the kingdom, of this rapture thing. Here's what Booth believed. He believed that one day Jesus would return. But when Jesus would return, he would join his army and carry it to victory. That was the image. I mean, this idea that we're going to fly away and leave the world behind to burn is basically unbiblical. The truth is that the world doesn't end that way. It doesn't end with a bang. It doesn't end with a whimper. When we sing the Hallelujah Chorus at Christmas and Easter, we're quoting from the book of Revelation, and the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdom of our God, and he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And when you pray the Lord's Prayer, listen, you don't pray for a rapture where you leave the earth. Here's what you pray for. You pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Where? Get that on earth. The vision of the kingdom preached by Wesley, Wilberforce and Finney reaches back through Jesus, the prophets and Moses called to let my people go to Genesis and the God who loves his creation, so powerfully drawn by Michelangelo on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. It's an incarnational image of hope carried through church history and into the Salvation Army. This is the cover of the Australian Christmas War Cry for 1893. The Salvation Santa Claus presents Australia with the golden key to prosperity. The territorial commander overseeing this vision was this man, Thomas Coombs. He was part of the original Christian mission group that in 1878 became the Salvation Army. 
He was the Army's first national commander in Canada. And in Australia, it was he who established the Limelight Department to vigorously promote the Darkest England scheme in Australia. Let's have a closer look at this drawing. Who does this robed and bearded figure remind you of? It bears a more than passing resemblance to the founder himself, William Booth. It's also what, in the 19th century, you would have expected Santa Claus to look like. A gaunt bearded figure, the Saint Nicholas of the church and Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol. Now, if you're into Da Vinci Code mysteries, you would have already seen how the Warcry artist has encoded one message from an old master into this image. The God who loves his creation from the Sistine ceiling. But there's also another image encoded here. The Christ, the light of the world. The Christ who knocks but does not force entry. The choice is ours. And yet, there's a deeper code. This image, the light of the world, was the most popular religious painting of the 19th century. Holman Hunt, the artist, was a member of a group of artists called the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood and linked to the emerging arts and crafts movement, who believed that industrial society was dehumanising God's creation. They wished to recapture the dignity of the human person by reconnecting with the world of the craftsman. It's perhaps best illustrated in this work by another of the Pre-Raphaelites, John Everett Millet. He was born in 1829, the same year as William and Catherine Booth. His painting of Christ in the House of His Parents shares a cultural resonance with Booth's vision of the dignity of work that underpinned the Darkest England scheme. The Salvation Santa Claus also holds a key in his hand. It's the key to the City of Prosperity. But just what kind of prosperity is being offered? The key is salvation and the gate is unlocked through the cross of Christ. To whom is the message directed? To all classes. In the front, there's an artisan with his sleeves rolled up, tanned skin, braces and bowler hat. Behind him, a well-dressed bearded gent in a top hat and behind him, carrying a scythe, a farmer. All may enter, the whosoever. If we follow where St. William is pointing out across the city, we see the crowd streaming down the high street. To where? Why, the Salvation Army Temple, of course. But see where it's sighted. And at this point, the artist does not wish to rely on code. He spells it out for us. The building next door is clearly labelled school. The one next to that, museum. And across the road, the technical school. The Salvation Army is positioned at the heart of the cultural and intellectual life of the city. In the latter chapters of Darkest England, William Booth talks of a Salvation Army intelligence department, which I propose to found on a small scale at first, will have in it the germ of vast extension, which will, if adequately supported, become a kind of university in which the accumulated experiences of the human race will be massed, digested, and rendered available to the humblest toiler in the great work of social reform. The life of the mind is marked out as essential to achieving the salvationist vision of a transformed world. The final group of images in the city are a series of great statues lining the high street. Here too, the artist wants to drive the message home and addresses us directly. The first statue, knowledge, is of course Moses holding the tablets of the law, God's expression of his will for humanity, the basis of right relationships. The basis of any good society is true religion. We need first to have an intelligent acquaintance with divine truth. Know your Bible. Next, wise government, home, local and national. That is, the scriptures are not just about you, your family and God. The guidance God gave Moses was about the good society, not just the nuclear family, not just the local neighbourhood, but the nation and indeed the world. Next, 
The tools necessary for such an enterprise are a basic right of all. Thus, the good society provides free education, both intellectual and moral. The last on this list, literature, art and science popularised. This is not just narrowly defined Christian knowledge. It's embracing knowledge of and about the world as part of God's good gifts. As Herbert Booth said of the new combination of literature, art and science called the movies, These means are employed by the worldly. They form a source of attraction in the theatres and music halls. Why should they be usurped by the enemy of souls? The next statue is labelled Truth, and the figure is Liberty. The connection, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The inscriptions below are concerned principally with the ethical dimensions of truth, honesty and justice. The first, purity in press and politics. Amen to that, we cry. Some themes are perennial. The second, justice, free and for all. As access to education is among the basics for participation in the good society, so is access to justice. The call of the Old Testament prophets echoes through to our own times. Lack of access to law led Booth to agitate for poor man's lawyers, what today we describe as legal aid. Honesty in commerce and finance. The greed is good philosophy of the radical free market, directly addressed by Booth in darkest England, resonates still. Let things alone. The laws of supply and demand and all the rest are the excuses by which those who stand on firm ground salve their consciences when they leave their brother to sink. They often enough are responsible for his disaster. And finally, a faithful pulpit and platform. The Salvation Army must speak and educate both its own congregations and the nation on such matters. The final statue along the high road bears the motto, Love. The figure is a Salvationist, lifting high a symbol of love, the cross of Christ. This is not the Jesus is my boyfriend, instant gratification sort of love. Rather, it is costly love, the incarnation, Love that may well lead not to worldly prosperity, but to the pain and poverty of the way of the cross. The exhortations on the base are towards world-engaging, kingdom-building love. First, the brotherhood of man, an active force. Salvationists share a global vision that is activist, outward-looking, seeking to build a better world for all. Unity of Christian effort. Goodwill between capital and labour. Finally, Federation of Colonies and Nations. In the 1860s, the United States fought a civil war to preserve the Union of States and give expression to universal rights. In the 1890s, Australians were about to enter into the vigorous debates over the federation of their own Australian colonies. The Army was both theologically and organisationally equipped for the coming of the global village. This then was the Salvation Army's Christmas gift to Australia in 1893. It's a message of both individual and social transformation. It was a local expression of the global message of the Darkest England scheme, launched just two years earlier at Exeter Hall in London a building long identified with William Wilberforce and the Christians of the Clapham sect who ended the slave trade. Everything that you could be charitable about was focused on the Exeter Hall. It was the centre of evangelism and philanthropy for all the Protestant denominations of the land and was celebrated throughout the world when an American came to London and if it was May he'd make a beeline for the May meetings in the Exeter Hall to see this wonderful display of Christian philanthropy. Late in 1893, the founder returned to Exeter Hall to launch a new campaign. Once more, he was to link the army with the great tradition of socially committed evangelicals, this time through the world-redeeming theology of his hero, John Wesley. Booth was to write a song for the campaign. It was printed in the English war cry at Christmas that year. The very same week, as the great vision on the cover of the Australian war cry. The crusade was called 
the Boundless Salvation campaign. And the words you know very well.